I don't know that there's anything left that we can still end up finding out is true. Let me tell you how smart yeah. Einstein was. If I had hair on my neck, it would be standing on edge as I see the depth to which he was connected to the operations of nature. I mean, can we say Einstein was a lot smarter than Newton? No, actually, if you want to put them head to head, I think I'd put Newton ahead. What? Yeah. Because... Chrome X. The Big Bang, the idea of the Big Bang, wasn't it articulated by a Jesuit priest? Yeah, it's true. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the name Georges Lemaitre. And he was an unusual character. Not only did he have a PhD in physics. From MIT. From MIT. He was a, a Jesuit priest and he deeply wanted to understand the big questions. And after Einstein wrote down the equations of the general theory of relativity, Lemaitre was the first to successfully apply them to the universe as a whole. Einstein had done a version of this earlier on, but Lemaitre is the one who really pushed this idea forward. And he came to the conclusion that the universe should be expanding. And if it's expanding, then if you sort of wind that film in reverse, everything gets smaller and smaller toward the past, suggesting that everything was compressed together into what he called the primeval atom. Will you tell everyone what Einstein said when he saw Lemaitre's calculation? Yeah, so Lemaitre joins Einstein at the Solvay conference in Brussels in 1927, and Einstein just turned to him and said, your calculations are correct, but your physics is abominable. Now, the reason Einstein knew that the calculations were correct is he'd already seen them about five years earlier by a Russian physicist named Alexander Friedman, who kind of did the same calculation and showed it to Einstein. At that point, Einstein said, your calculations are incorrect. But Friedman stayed on Einstein and proved to Einstein that the calculations were correct, but he clearly did not think that the universe was expanding. At what point did he see the light? Well, he saw the light when we saw the light. So Edwin Hubble, using the powerful telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory, saw the light from distant galaxies that he recognized by virtue of how the light was being stretched, that the galaxies were all rushing away. And as galaxies rush away, the light that they send toward us will get stretched outward. Red shifted is the language that we use. And he found a pattern in the red shifts that the farther a galaxy is, the faster it was moving away, which is exactly what you'd expect from a universe that's expanded. And once that data was clear, Einstein pretty much agreed. He realizes that space is expanding. Let me tell you how smart Amazing. Einstein was. In one of his equations, he put in a term that he later regretted putting in, and he called it his greatest blunder. This is a term that he looked at his equations, and his equations showed that the universe had to be either expanding or collapsing. Now, no one had any idea that the universe, which is everything, would be doing anything. Yeah, it's just there. It's just there, right? right? So he says, this can't be right. Let me put in this term. It's a legitimate mathematical term, but physically, what the hell are you doing, Albert? And he says, this term will help stabilize it from collapse, okay? And it's a pressure force to push outward and that'll stabilize it just a couple of years later Hubble discovered that in fact the universe was expanding and he didn't need the term he could have predicted that the universe should either be expanding or expanding but he didn't he put in this term he said it's his biggest blunder now you know what Einstein's actual biggest blunder is? Saying that that was his biggest blunder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because in fact, in 1998, we discovered a pressure in the universe pressing against gravity that is exactly the term that he put in. His not, biggest not blunder, blunder is thinking he made a blunder. That's how smart he how, is. That's badass smart. Let's go way back. There was a day when there were seven known planets, and the word planet had an unambiguous definition, clear and simple, defined by the ancient Greeks, planetes, meaning wanderers. There were seven objects in the night in the sky that would move against the background sky. And it's those seven names drawn from Roman and Norse mythologies that landed as the seven names for the days of the week, of Saturdays after Saturn. Sunday's named after the sun, yes. Monday, the moon, this sort of thing. There you go, for a couple of thousand years, you get to Copernicus in 1543. He says, well, maybe the sun is in the middle of all this. And if we are, then Earth goes around the sun like these other things we had been calling a planet. So maybe Earth is a planet. And so overnight, with the publication of De Revolutionibus, 1543, Nicholas Copernicus, Polish astronomer and mathematician. Overnight, practically, we went from seven planets down to five because we lost the sun and we lost the moon. As we go around the sun, the moon goes around Earth, and we gained the Earth. We went from seven down to five up to six. And there it was. Well, Einstein shows us that time is far more flexible than we would have thought based on a Newtonian world, which is really based on our intuitive picture of how the universe is put together. In Einstein's vision, time becomes flexible. It can warp, it can bend, and that definitely 
allows time travel to the future. When you say it definitely allows time travel to the future, that can, that can happen. That is, that is within the laws of physics as we currently understand them. If you want to see what the Earth is like a million years from now, Albert Einstein lays out a blueprint for what you need to do to get there. Would you like to know what it of is? Of course! Yeah, so there are a couple of ways. You can go out in space, travel near the speed of light, and turn around and come back. Your clock will tick off time very slowly compared to clocks on Earth. So when you come back, maybe one year has gone by, but a million years may have gone by on the Earth clocks. Or if you don't like traveling near the speed of light, hang out near the edge of a black hole. Again, your clock will tick off time very slowly, so when you come back to Earth, much more time will have elapsed, which means you will have leapfrogged into Earth's future. That is time travel to the future. It, so is it all gravity and speed? It's speed and gravity. That's the key new feature that Einstein injects into our understanding of time. I mean, can we say Einstein was a lot smarter than Newton? No, actually, if you want to put them head to head, I think I put Newton ahead. What? Yeah, because Newton came into the world and there wasn't a base of scientific understanding from him to jump off from. He had no he, shoulders of giants that's to right. stand on. That's right, although he said that he did. But that was just, you know, being quite gracious. He really invented modern way of looking at the world, the mathematical insights, the nature of reality. And look, Einstein was no slouch, don't get me wrong, right? <laughs> In terms of revolutionizing the way we engage with reality, Newton was second to none. So Isaac Newton was brilliant. I own most of anything he's ever written. And I sit there and I read it. So I read the sentences he put to page. Hair goes up on the back. I don't actually have hair there. If I had hair on my neck, it would be standing on edge as I see the depth to which he was connected to the operations of nature. There is no doubt about it. The man discovered the laws of gravity. It's rumored that he sat under the apple tree, but what is certain is that in the same field of view, he saw an apple drop and the moon in orbit around the Earth. He sees the two of them. One is falling to the ground and the other is like up there in space. He connects the two, suggests that the same force of gravity is operating on both of them. They're both falling towards Earth. He hypothesized, well, how's that possible? Because I can drop this camera on the ground, it would fall. But if it's in orbit, it's not falling. But it is falling. It is. If you're in orbit, you are falling towards Earth. He drew a diagram to illustrate this. He suggested, suppose you had a hill and you sort of fire a cannonball. Not very fast. It would just sort of kind of fall. Fire it a little faster. It goes farther before it hits the ground, doesn't it? Even faster, it'll go even farther. Now wait a minute, Earth is curved. So if you keep this up, this thing is coming around the backside of the Earth. So he asked himself, it must be a speed sufficiently high so that that cannonball comes right back to the cannon. The cannonball ought to just slide on by and stay in orbit. The fact is the cannonball is falling every moment it's there. The difference is it's going sideways so fast that the amount that it has fallen is the same amount that the Earth's surface has curved away from it. That is the speed that gets you orbit. He figures this out. And that's why the moon is behaving the same way the apple is. The apple just doesn't happen to have sideways motion to bring it someplace other than right below. Galileo perfects the telescope. He looks up, he says, whoa, I see craters, mountains, valleys on the moon. The sun has spots. Venus goes through phases. This became the corpus of evidence for Earth going around the sun in support of Copernicus's idea that Earth went around the sun. What was the second thing he did with his telescope? He contacted the Doge of Venice, invited him to the clock tower and said, look at what this instrument can do for you as we look out into the lagoon. You can identify a ship's intentions, friend or foe, by its flag 10 times farther away than you can with the unaided eye. Venice bought a boatload of these telescopes in the service of their military defense. And this was a source of money to Galileo. Now he could go look at the universe. This has been a two-way street ever since people have looked up. Was Galileo treated as a kind of a devil in a sense? The simple story is he makes these discoveries. They conflict with the teachings of the Catholic Church. They put him on trial. They find him guilty of saying, that Earth goes around the sun and not vice versa, as well as other discoveries he's made with his devil's instrument. What they don't tell you, or they would tell you if you read a longer biography about him, is that he actually made fun 
of the Pope. Public fun of the Pope. He wrote a book in Italian, not in Latin, which is the academic language of the day, in Italian, which means the local people can read it. And in it, he invents a conversation between a simpleton and a someone who is wise of the ways of the universe. If you track the statements of the simpleton, they're all statements that have come by official decree from the Catholic Church. He's really a pompous a-hole. He did not express the, the respect he really should have for people who had much more power over him. He could have published in Latin, had it spread around the world among academic circles, and I'm betting he probably would not have gone to trial. That's my read of this. And in the period, it's the Renaissance after all. If you needed more reasons to think that Columbus was a dick, let me <laughs> add one to it. On his third voyage, he's in, I think it's Hispaniola. He's gotta get back to Spain. He doesn't have enough resources, not enough food for his crew. So he asks the natives, would you please give us some of your stock that you have collected from your farming. Now this particular group of natives only makes exactly the amount of food they need to tie to the next crop. They don't have surplus. So they said, no, we don't have surplus, sorry. Columbus knew that one week hence, coincidentally, there was gonna be a total lunar eclipse where the full moon enters Earth's shadow and disappears. The geometry of that event, it's just a simple lunar eclipse, but the geometry says that sunlight passes around Earth through Earth's atmosphere and takes on sunset colors that leach into Earth's shadow, giving the moon, if you can see it at all, a deep red amber hue, almost the color of blood. He says to the natives, if you do not give us food, my God, which is more powerful than your God, will make the moon disappear and it will turn blood red. That will happen in one week. You have one week to comply. Some of them were skeptical. What? You can't, what? Others said, shit, we gotta do what this guy <laughs> said. Look at the ships they came in, their guns, their power. Look what they've got. Sure enough, right on cue, the moon begins to disappear. That is a famous woodcut. And notice the natives bowing to him and he stands proudly because he knows the science. He knows the astronomy. He knew this. Mm. And so he invokes this to dominate people who are not yet scientifically literate. And within seconds of this beginning, they bring him all the resources he wants. We don't know what happened, you know, back at the island, whether the people survived the winter, but he got back to the island. That, that is one microcosm of, <laughs> of ways that the universe has been invoked in this elevator and you cut the elevator cable, up until the point you hit the bottom, you are weightless. You're in free fall. Uh, here's an experiment you do. It's the, a very cool, cheap experiment. Take a tall glass of water in a paper cup, make sure it's tall, fill it with water, punch holes in the side. Obviously, the water's gonna leak out. The water at the bottom hole will spew out farther than the water in holes high because the water weighs more above it. There's more pressure at the bottom to spray the water out. It's all because of the weight of the water. Take that cup of water while it's spilling, drop it. The instant it leaves your hand, it is weightless because it's in free fall. The cup is weightless, the water is weightless. And if the water has no weight, then the water does not know to exit the hole in the side of the cup that you puncture. So the instant you drop that cup, the water cuts off. It just stops. But while it fell, it is evidence that the water became weightless. It's very simple, right? So all we have here is a bottle of water that has holes in it, right? So of course the water is spraying out of the holes because gravity is pulling on the water, right? right yeah. But if Einstein is right, if I drop this bottle, the water will no longer feel gravity, so the water should stop spraying out. So let's see it. Three, two, one. Whoa. Wow, come on now, okay. You pull out a microscope, oh my gosh, Lee Wen Hoke, the microscope guy, he got a, a, a drop of pond water, puts it under his microscope, just to think to do this. It's just water. Why do you think that's something interesting to do? He said, I wonder. He was curious. He puts it under and sees little, what he described as animacules, happily a-swimming. Animacules. Animacules. These are like the amoebas and paramecia. He reports on this to the, you know, the scientific authorities, and they don't believe him. They say, Von Leeuwenhoek, uh, we think you might have had too much gin before you wrote this letter. Why would anyone believe this? That there's entire creatures, an entire universe of creatures thriving in a drop of pond water. And so the way science works is one report does not make it true. You need verification. They sent people to the Netherlands to verify his results. And there it was, the birth of microscopy. And then they looked at everything. 
Well, I have a deep affection for Einstein, and look, he was a smart, smart dude, man. It's astounding when you look at our understanding of the world before him and after him. He changes our understanding of space, time, matter, energy, and gravity. That's a lot of stuff for one person to sort of reach out and reshape and remold. Undeniably the real deal in a, in a massive way. But yeah, he did have also an intuition and understanding of how to work the media. And he was able to play up the mad scientist, the wild-eyed genius in a way that really worked. And you know, look, his, his big discovery, the general theory of relativity, you know, it was in the midst of World War I. And the world needed a hero at that point. And I think he knew that the world needed a hero. And he was willing to be that hero. And he worked with the press and the media in such a way to become that hero. I think that was a kind of wonderful service to provide to humanity. Yeah, he was quite here. Here, right. There's a previous time, was it 100 years, 100 and 10 years ago, where there's something called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Yeah. There was an equation that would show how much energy would come from glowing objects. And so there'd be the spectrum of what it gives you. Okay. And if you follow that equation to higher and higher energies, it blows up and it's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Nice. Now we knew that's not happening in the actual universe, right. but we had no theoretical understanding of why the actual universe was not doing what our equation said. Right. Max Planck comes along, finish the story. Yes, and Max Planck comes along and he suggests an idea that he never fully believed. This is interesting. He suggests that maybe the energy only comes in packets of certain quantized sizes. And therefore your calculation of the amount of energy was biased by assuming that energy could come in arbitrarily large or small amounts. If you assume it only comes in packets of a minimum size, then the total energy inside that cavity is It actually converges finite. and drops off. And it agrees with experiments. And he got an equation. The equation is like, holy shit, this would come out of someone's head. Yeah. Right. And was it just a fitting function, or did he actually have deep physics insight? He had think? a model in mind. He really quantized the energy. He broke it up into little bits and redid the calculation, and that's what came out. But then later on, he never fully believed that energy in photons, as we now call it, did come in little packets. And so it was really Einstein who came along and came up with the idea of photons more particularly with the photoelectric effect. And that's Discreet. how he wins the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Many people think he won the prize for special relativity or general relativity, no. My boy could have had eight Nobel Prizes. And so of course, since if energy is quantized, thus is born the branch of physics called Quantum, quantum mechanics. physics, quantum yeah. mechanics. Wow. Yeah. And that probably has had the greatest impact on life as we know it. And that was it. the year 1900.